Well, welcome. And we're in session two of Ecotheology as part of the Ecotheology and the Missio Dei course. We saw in the last session that Ecotheology provides an ecological eye into the study of God. It is thoroughly theocentric in that it's a study of God and all that God has made, but it reminds us that the voice of the non-human creation, or the more than human creation, or the other than human creation if you prefer, has often gone unheard and been treated as the background to a theodrama, so that's the story of what God's doing in the world, that deals solely with humans. It's therefore um, we need to take a biocentric view as well and, and understand that the theodrama doesn't just treat creation as a background but it's actively involved in that. And given that humans are made in the image of God and therefore we're meant to reflect God to creation, um, we are, and the creation are tied up together in, in a mutual renewal. And we'll talk about that a bit more later. Uh, we also saw that in order to develop a robust eco-theology, eco-missiology and eco-spirituality, the latter one being an aspect we're not going to develop too much, we need to build or rebuild a biblically informed Christian worldview. So digging back into scripture to mine it for its richness and making use of the other three corners of the Wesleyan quadrilateral. So not just scripture, uh, but tradition and reason and, and reflect upon our personal experience as well. And so we examine scripture as narrative and we try and read that narrative in a way that's inclusive of the non-human creation. And so it's a biblical theological point of view then that we're going to be taking in this course rather than the systematic one. So we're, what we're going to do in, in this um, session is to tease that out a bit and it's kind of a flying overview of the Bible per se and looking at the creation and I guess in a parallel sense understanding God's mission to renew that and that's a theme that we'll pick up in, in later lectures. So consider this session if you will a broad overview of the kinds of topics and the kinds of passages that we're going to look at and certainly in the early parts when I'm talking about the work of uh, John Walton there are accompanying lectures of his where he'll go into more detail than I will here. So let's begin. So John Walton has written a number of books on the Old Testament and in particular looking at the early chapters in the so-called primeval history which is Genesis chapters 1 through 11. And he makes a number of observations in his first book The Lost World of Genesis 1. And his main claim and it's worth getting hold of the book if you can, and certainly you'll get this from listening to his lecture, is that the word bara, which means create, and it's a verb that only ever has God as the one doing the creating, and asa, make a functional and not material ontology. Uh, so it's about order, role, and relationship. And he, he makes this analogy that I think is quite helpful in this regard, and it's it's the following. Say you're going to build a house. What sorts of things are you interested in when you think about building a house? Well, there's a, a building permit. And then there's the architectural plan. And the materials that you're going to build the house with. And the, the contractors and the subcontractors and the wiring that goes in. Uh, obviously, there's the location of where you're going to build the house as well. And so all of these aspects relate to the materials of which the house is made. And certainly that's a major focus in Western thinking, particularly since the Industrial Revolution. Human beings have got really, really good at building things. Uh, engineering is an attractive industry because you get to build real stuff. But instead of considering the building in which you live a house, what about when it's a home? Well, simple things like which is the kid's bedroom or which is the, uh, the um, married couple's bedroom things like marks on the walls. You know when a child is growing up and you make a little pencil mark as they continue to grow and you write the height and the name next to it and so on. So all those things about what's meant to actually happen in the rooms and the sorts of experiences that you have over the years, they're the things that make a house a home. The little decorations and the roles that they play and so on and so forth. And so what Walton argues <coughs> 
This is Genesis chapter 1 is the setting up of creation as a temple. And that's a temple in which God is going to dwell. That's a, that's a, a different take um, and to one which you'd normally hear. And what he's trying to do in one sense, and, and it's not the main focus of this course, of course, um, is to circumvent the whole debate about you know, creation versus scientific descriptions the way the world is. I'm primarily concerned in this course in understanding the idea then is what what is creation for and what are humans for and what's our role in the non-human creation, what's our relationship to it. So you'd be very familiar with Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, verse 2, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while the wind from God swept over the face of the waters. And so this um, void and darkness in the Hebrew is tohu wabuhu. I'm not much of a Hebrew scholar, so if I've mangled the pronunciation, I apologise, but the, the understanding of this is, is, is interesting. It's normally translated as formless void. But if you go to Isaiah 34.11, and just flicking through my Bible, and you might want to follow along with me. It's always good to um, have your Bible handy when you're um, listening along to lectures. Isaiah 34 and verse 11 and it says but the hawk and the hedgehog shall possess it the owl and the raven shall live in it he shall stretch the line of confusion over it and plummet and the plummet of chaos over its nobles so this is describing judgment on the nations and so there's this sense of, if you're looking at the, the broader context, goes back to verse 8. For the Lord has a day of vengeance, a year of indication of Zion's cause. And so he's talking about judgment and destruction and laying waste to Edom. And so there's a sense in that there's, there's a chaos that's been created by God's divine judgment. Uh, and things are, are returning to a state of of lack of function, uh, not useful. If we look uh, at the word uh, bohu, so wa in wa bohu is, is and in the Hebrew, so it's the tohu and the bohu. Uh, bohu in Deuteronomy 32 and verse 10, flicking through, and this is the end of Deuteronomy, and you've got the Song of Moses and it's his parting words to, to Israel. And 32 and verse 10. He sustained him in a desert land, in a howling wilderness waste. He shielded him, cared for him, guarded him as the apple of his eye. And of course he's talking about uh, the people, the nation of Israel. And so it's the same word bohu that appears in Genesis 1-2. And it's described as a desert land, a howling wilderness waste. In other words, it's outside of the land uh, that Israel was meant to take hold of, and there was no agricultural value to it, which should be a bit of a hint for us. Um, it's this whole idea of form and function. And in fact, you can see it in the six days of creation. And, and um, Walton points this out, that you get a separation of things. So on the day one, you get a separation of the light from the darkness. It's a separation of night from day. That's the creation of time. Then on the second day, the waters above and the waters below are separated by the firmament. Uh, so it's the creation of space and weather. And then the third day, you get the separation of land uh, from the sea. So all the water, land is put in one place and all the waters in another place. And, and the point of that then is that you've got dry land where you can grow food. And so these are three distinct functions, which are followed by placing the functionaries in it. So, for example, Genesis 1, 14 to 19. Let's read that together. 
And God said, Let there be lights in the dome of the sky, to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So you get that sense that, uh, as Michael Velker describes, is that this isn't a mechanistic, naturalistic understanding of creation. There's a tying of culture together with nature. So marking the seasons. Now I studied astrophysics as an undergraduate and I could dredge out my notes or grab a textbook and explain to you the basics of how stars form. And from a purely mechanistic point of view, stars just form by the laws of physics. They're not for anything. They simply exist due to the laws of gravity and of um, the strong and weak nuclear forces and the laws of electromagnetism. But what Velka is saying is that in this creation account they're given roles. They rule the night and the day, they mark seasons and the creatures who are interested in the marking of the seasons of course are agriculturally based human beings. And so you can see this quote here from Velka. A merely naturalistic understanding of creation does not attain to the level of the classic creation texts. In other words, science only tells you so much. Revelation and reflection upon the divine will tell you a great deal more. So that's what the lights are for. Have you ever thought what animals are for? I suspect a good deal of the time you might think that animals are purely for human use or perhaps enjoyment if you're a wildlife documentary level like myself. But what does the book of Revelation say? And God said, Let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply in the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. Did you notice that? There's a blessing for the birds and the fish, and it's to be fruitful and multiply. And it's precisely the same blessing that's given to human beings. I don't know if you know about the passenger pigeon. And this is particularly pertinent for uh, North Americans. The passenger pigeon is a bird that covered the sky. It could cover the sky and its flocks for three days at a time. Humans hunted it to extinction. So I want you to pause for a minute and think about the vastness of a one species that covers the sky for three days that's being fruitful and that's multiplying and what did humans do? Shut them with guns until there were none left. Think about how many other species human beings have done that to and yet this creation account tells us that God blessed the birds of the air and the fish of the sea to be fruitful and multiply. So how should a Christian feel about human induced extinctions of animals? or, indeed, the vast reduction of their numbers. And then, of course, we get to um, what are humans for? And you can read for yourself Genesis 1, 26-28. I read it uh, last session. Where to have dominion? Notice it says that we're to subdue the land, which, of course, is meant to mean that we engage in agriculture. And you can see that a little bit later on about um, in this particular version of the creation account as opposed to Genesis 2. Uh, that's, oh, where is it now? I've given you every plant, this is in verse 29, yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. So human beings are meant to be fruitful and multiply and share that 
with other creatures and we're meant to share the plants of the earth with other creatures so yes we're to have dominion and yes we're meant to subdue the land for agriculture but not at the expense of the non-human creation so that puts a real different take on what animals are for and what human beings are for we have to hold those two together now I've been talking about this idea that Walton puts forward of creation as a temple and that and, and the reason we're doing this of course is to see how that theme propagates through the rest of scripture and ask ourselves in more detail what are human beings for what is God created us for and how does that reflect the Missio Dei in the mission of the church at the end of the first creation account we read that thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all their multitude and on the seventh day God finished the work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done so God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation and rest in this account is, is literally the word ceases and it's the word sabbat from which we get the word sabbath from the idea of sabbath rest and you can see there on the screen that this is picked up again in Exodus 2011 and it's talking about Sabbath rest for human beings and it says for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth the sea and all that is in them and rested which is the Hebrew word nuha on the seventh day therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath Sabbath day and made it holy so the end of creation in Genesis 2 is linked through this idea of resting or, or ceasing Sabbath Shabbat rather with the idea of rest in, in Exodus 2011 and again this word or a, f a form of Nuha appears in Psalm 132 now Psalm 132 is a song of ascents and you understand that uh, Jerusalem's up on a hill so once a year in the Day of Atonement you get all the pilgrims going into Israel uh, uh, into Jerusalem rather and they would sing pilgrim songs and Psalm 132 would be one of these songs and, and I've highlighted words for you here verse 7 let us go to his dwelling place let us worship at his footstool so there's language of worship and footstool is is, is of a, th a language metaphors of a throne room rise up O Lord and go to your resting place Menuha you and the ark of your might and so you can see a classic example of what's known as Hebrew Hebrew parallelisms which is that the Hebrew writer will tell you something and then they'll tell you again in a slightly different way so dwelling place is meant to uh, be paralleled by resting place and worshipping at the footstool is, is meeting God um, at the ark of your might, the ark of the covenant remember on top of that there were the, the cherubim and, and God's presence uh, would appear or manifest itself in between uh, those two at the mercy seat so what this is saying then it, referring back or looking back then at Genesis 1 and 2 is that creation is ordered as a temple and therefore by definition is something in which God dwells and the Jerusalem temple, uh, temple is creation in miniature because it's this specific place where God will meet with his people that he's called out of the world in order to be a blessing to the world if you think Genesis 12 1 to 3 now straight away off the bat what that should tell us is therefore if creation itself is a temple it starts to erode this sacred secular divide that we often place you know the idea that there are sacred professions and there are secular or profane even profane professions so people hold in high esteem being ordained in the ministry of a church or being some kind of paid staff worker or being a lecturer in a, a theological college or whatever and then you've got the things that are in between the kind of caring ministries which is doctors and teachers and nurses and that kind of thing and then finally you end up with everything else and yet Genesis is telling us that creation is a temple and therefore in some profound sense creation is sacred space and who works in a temple but a priest <laughs>
So we're, we're, we're leading somewhere here to understand more the human role, the human vocation, and therefore, off the Missio Day, what's, what's our mission? There is other language there that makes this a lot clearer. And so there's the word um, in the Hebrew, Kala, which is finished. Uh, and you can see Genesis 2, 1, thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And the same word in the Hebrew is used in Exodus 39, 32, and Exodus 40, 33. In this way all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting was finished, and the Israelites had done everything just as the Lord had commanded Moses. And likewise in Exodus 40, he set up the court around the tabernacle and the altar, and put up the screen at the gate of the court, so Moses finished the work. And we're meant to see those parallels, I think, um, which again reaffirms that the creation, uh, sorry, the temple is, or the tabernacle at this point, of the tent of meeting is the creation in miniature. A few other things we might note that um, rest uh, is for engagement in normal activities. So Deuteronomy, uh, where are we? Deuteronomy 12 and verse 10. When you cross over the Jordan and live in the land that the Lord your God is allotting to you, and when he gives you rest from your enemies all around you so that you live in safety, then you shall bring everything that I command you to the place where the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. And so it's the idea that entering into the land will be a sense of rest for the people of Israel. And so again, the land, it's often described in almost Edenic language. So Eden is the, or, or rather Israel, is, um, or the land of Israel, or Palestine if you will, is again creation in miniature, a source of divine blessing where the people experience God's uh, presence. Now, if you think about a temple in many parts of the world, you will of course find religious devotees, but what are they bringing their devotion to? Very often what you will find will be some kind of image. Now you might be aware that in certain Christian traditions like the Orthodox tradition and the Catholic tradition, tradition they often talk about icons, which are images of the saints or images of Jesus and so on, which I should note they don't worship but they use to help their meditation or their focus. This word icon is in the Greek translation of Genesis 1, 26-27. So if you're expecting an image of the deity in a temple, in a pagan temple, if we follow the logic and say, well, Genesis 1 describes creation as a temple, well, we expect some kind of image of God, surely. Verse 27. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God he created them, male and female, he created them. And herein lies the insanity of idolatry. Because at one level there is zero representation of God in the Bible. There's the authors go out of their way to try and not represent God by any given image, even though there are manifestations and in imagery, they're all very indirect. But here we see human beings as described as being made in the image of God. And you would expect an image in a temple, which says something very profound about the human being, and therefore about uh, how we carry out the Missio Dei, which is to care for creation and to see all things renewed, is that we have a fundamental part in that because we represent God to the rest of creation. You know, it's not a one-to-one -one thing. Very clearly, the animals don't come to human beings so that they might worship God in the way in which you'd worship a deity through an image in a temple. But nonetheless, in a very profound sense, we reflect back to the creation what it means to be God by bearing God's image and likeness. And that has to cast uh, a different shape to this whole idea of subduing and having dominion. Okay, as I've already been alluding, 
humans, if we are in a temple, then we must serve as priests. In The Lost World of Adam and Eve, John Walton, under Proposition 12, talks at length about this. And I don't want to read the entire chapter because it's several pages long. But let me uh, tease out a few couple of things. Maybe I'll just read the start of it. The garden into which Adam was placed would be a familiar setting for sacred space in the ancient world. The image of fertile waters flowing through the sacred space of God's presence is one of the most common in the iconography of the ancient Near East. Given this background, we can see that the Garden of Eden is not simply beautiful green space, though it is, to provide people with food, which it does. Far more than anything else, it is sacred space that reflects the fact that God is dwelling there. And you see that later on, I mean, God walks through the garden, right? We learn in Genesis 1 that God was coming to dwell in the cosmos, thus making it sacred space, but we are not told where the centre of sacred space would be. In Genesis 2, that is clarified. Since the seven days of Genesis 1 have been associated with temple inauguration, it would be logical to assume that the terrestrial location of the centre of the sacred space, the temple concept inherent in the garden, takes place in close proximity, time proximity to Genesis 1. So he's trying to uh, unify the accounts together. Uh, a little bit later on, he writes, when we understand the garden and the sacred space and see that the presence of God is the main point, we can begin to comprehend that the account of Gen in Genesis 2 is not essentially about material human origins. God reveals to Adam that he, Adam, is mortal, but then sets up sacred space, the garden, where a relationship to God can bring the remedy life. God puts Adam into the sacred space, commissioned to serve there. I have proposed that the terms serve and keep, and these are in Genesis 2.15, convey priestly tasks rather than landscaping and agrarian responsibilities. And he goes into a little bit about the, um, the Hebrew. And the first word that's paired in, in Genesis 2.15 is, is serve, and that often refers to religious service. And the second word is keep, and that is used with reference uh, throughout the Bible to keep the law. Um, so this idea then is not simply that it's a nice garden to work in, but in fact that we have a priestly function. That serving or looking after the creation is service to the one who made the garden in the first place. And so you can jump forward and, and look at the language of the second Adam in Romans uh, where Paul's talking about Jesus and, and Paul comes back and revisits Genesis 3 and the idea of the fall through that lens of Christ that if we are renewed through the Spirit as renewed Adams and Eves that should therefore imply that the mission of the Christian is as much to look after the creation as it was for Adam when he was placed in the garden and Eve formed from uh, most likely his side. Okay. Oh, where am I? Sorry, I'm just jumping about here. Here we go. All right. One of the ideas that's often applied to, to thinking about this service is the idea of stewardship. Now, stewardship is you know, very much a financial term, managing the books, as it were. But Richard Borkham, who's pictured there, wants to give it a bit of a serve, and I'm, I'm interested to, to know on the forum what you think about this. Firstly, he argues that, well, to, to step back a little bit, the word steward is not in Genesis 1 uh, and 2. Whether or not the concepts there is, is the point that's being debated. But the idea of stewarding creation, managing it, the entire creation, Borkham says is, is, is an example of human hubris. And I think what he's getting at here is that we need to remind ourselves that it's one thing to bear the image of God, to reflect divine uh, character. But how do you steward creation when you have natural disasters or when 
climate change is, is running away. People start to talk about geoengineering, that we can modify the, the amount of sunlight coming in by putting up aerosols into the atmosphere, or we can create huge machines for drawing out, or huge engineering projects for drawing out carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And I'm not one to have too much of a sceptical attitude towards technology, but I think the point that Borkham is making is to say that it's one thing to be made in the image of God, and another thing to be God. Which is to say, human beings might be very clever, but we're not omniscient. We might be very powerful, but we're not on omnipotent. And very often our power ends up uh, doing more damage than good. Borkham suggests that the idea of stewardship also excludes God because it's simply a focus upon human capabilities and role. He thinks that it lacks specific content. It's a very generalised idea and, and one of the things that I talked about in the last session was about the contextual nature of, um, of eco mission in the local context. You know, so it's about this river, it's about this mountain, it's about this coastline, etc., etc. It places humans over and not within creation. And it's on that note, it's interesting. Oh, actually, we've got some other key ideas, and I'll, I'll back that up in a second uh, on the importance of that. And you might argue, well, surely humans are over creation. That's what the text says, and we're smarter than the rest of creation. But I think I said this in the last session: is that really the Bible knows two categories of being the pre-existent creator and the contingent creation and we're firmly on the other side of the ledger and Borkham also suggests that the idea of stewardship which is normally extracted from Genesis 1 26 through 28 really isolates one text what about Psalm 104 for example which looks at divine care of the entire of the creation and human beings and our economic interests are a small part of that. Um, a, a few things are worth covering uh, and we've already already covered one of these things that kabash which is the Hebrew word for subdue is only applied to the Eretz, the land for possession and agriculture not for the animals in the world. And so we're meant to hold in tension the fruitfulness and the multiplication of non-human creatures. Uh, secondly, the word radar, uh, which means, or raha rather, which means rule, is more likely the care of than the use of non-domestic animals. In fact, you'll know a vegetarian context of Genesis chapter 1. So we're meant to look after animals that aren't domesticated for our use and not to rule over them per se. And you'll see too, uh, let's go to Genesis 124. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. And then Genesis 2.7. And then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. So the common context is the, the soil. It's the terra rossa, um, red earth. And it's talking about wet clods in, in the case of Genesis 2, 7 because of course God's already watered the, um, the land with a mist, depending upon your translation, rather than dust. Per se, you know, which is this kind of loose, uh, loose soil. But the point is fairly clear: is that there's a common origin and a common connection with the earth. And the other thing is that there's this common language too of living creatures, or nefesh haya, living souls, because in the Hebrew way of thinking soul is a holistic term. It doesn't this mean the separable bit that goes off to heaven when you die. A person's soul is is the totality of who they are. So if someone asks you, does your dog have a soul? The biblical answer is yes. The implications of what that means precisely is another thing, but in, in terms of pure Hebrew ways of thinking, we all have souls because we all are souls if we're living creatures.
Well, briefly some implications then. Uh, firstly, care for creation is worship. It's part of imaging God to creation. So if you want to genuinely worship God, it's not simply about the songs that you sing on a Sunday, but it's the way in which you care for the earth through the rest of the week. Uh, this or all, all this uh, thinking that we've been looking at should shape our dominion. It's about use, not abuse. About using, but not using up. So clearing all the forests is using up, using timber, uh, and and other things about you know from um, forests etc. That in itself isn't a bad thing. But if you wipe out all the forests, then um, this is not a godly. Uh, way of imaging the creator God back to the rest of creation um, it reminds us too that creation is more than humans and so we've seen already the blessing of animals to be fruitful and multiply which mirrors what human beings do and plants for food and I invite you to read Psalm 104 so that's creation in a nutshell, and remember that's the first act of Tom Wright's five-act play. So what about act number two? Oh, here we go. And there's just a summary slide which covers the things that we've um, we've talked about just now. The um, the issue of the fall is. A complicated one. But in essence, what we want to do is ask the question, and it will be altogether too brief in this context, where does evil come from? Why do people do bad things? And how does that influence the non-human world? So there's a number of ideas um, in this figure, and we're not going to get to go into them all at this point in time and you will come back to this when you read the relevant chapter of um, All Things New. But I want to start with a discussion question. Here's something for you to go off now and to have a think about and post on the forum. Why do we typically conceive of sin as limited to personal acts such as sexual and reproductive issues and not larger political or social ones? So hopefully you had a, a few things to say on the forum, or you will shortly after you finish this lecture. There's a whole bunch of things um, that people debate about this. So Michael Northcutt um, seems to think that, or suggests that going from our duties in the garden to agriculture outside of the garden is a fall into agriculture because when you think about the Anthropocene and human impacts upon the earth some scientists will talk about five stages or five potential candidates for when we first really started making a mess of the planet and one of those is agriculture because of course as soon as you start growing crops and you can have a, um, a reserve of seed to tide you over for bad seasons etc you can plant fresh crops and as soon as you have a surplus you can feed more human beings and therefore you need more food so you cut down more forest and so you can track through the origins of agriculture how human beings have cleared vast tracts of forest so what we see today in countries like um, Brazil for example or Australia which to my shame I acknowledge our country is at the forefront of land clearing happened in Europe centuries ago and in the Middle East before that. But of course the setting for or the assumption for Genesis 2 is that in the garden was hard agricultural toil already. And so the idea that being ejected from the garden represents a fall into agriculture is a nonsense. Certainly there's a sense in which the fall is a chasing after or transgressing of God-given limits, but when you start to dig into this idea of what it means to know both good and evil, it's a major theme of uh, Proverbs, for example. 
And so it's not so much that the pursuit of wisdom and knowledge of good and evil is in, in of itself a bad thing, but it's the, all in the timing. It's all in the grasping. It's not in slowly learning from God, but it's going ahead and, and grabbing after it. And we should see echoes of that in Philippians chapter 2, for example, where it says that Jesus didn't take equality with God, something to be taken for granted, in essence. Now, one of the things that we could chase down, which we won't spend a lot of time doing now, but will happen a bit later on, is talked about in this book, The Return of the Chaos Monsters, and other backstories of the Bible. And in essence, what Gregory Mobley is saying is that creation starts with disorder. And we don't have to argue about whether it's eternally pre-existent or created at some earlier stage. That's simply not what's on view. Remembering that the Bible's main interest is not material origins, not where this chaos came from, but showing that God is the one in control of ordering that and ordering it into something in which human beings can inhabit to image God back to the rest of creation. And so the disorder of the tohu and the bohu in Genesis 1-2 is contained. Oh, I'm, let's go back. Let's go back. All right. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, the tehom, while the wind from God swept over the face of the waters. So these, these initial waters were in a state of chaos. And so what does God do? God separates the waters above from the waters below by a dome and separates dry land from the waters. And so, as we noted, you can um, engage in agriculture. You can see on the right is a figure of the ancient Near Eastern picture and what and how the ancients understood what the universe looked like. So there's the waters above the firmament there and then you can see the divine dwelling above that fixed in this firmament with the sun, the moon and the stars and then you get the, the foundations of the heavens and then the earth is on top of the underworld and the foundations of the earth. Now what happens in the story of the flood? And I invite you to do that comparison. Go and compare Genesis 1 with the flood narrative. And you see that the firmament gives way and the waters bubble up from the deep. And that order which enables agriculture and human society and civilization is undone. If we go to Genesis 6 and verse 5, the Lord saw the wickedness of humankind, that the, the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth, and that everything, every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And so it says that God was sorry, or God repents, they had made humankind on the earth and grieved him, and it grieved into his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out the earth, the human beings. I have created people together with animals and creeping things and birds in the air. And you can hear the language of Genesis 1. So in other words, the fall or this idea, well, the unfolding drama, there's, there's quite a bit of debate and discussion to be had, but, and in fact, amongst Hebrew scholars, Genesis 6, verses 1 through 4 and 5, actually describe more of a fall than Adam and Eve, but moving from the unwise decision of the first human pair to eat of the fruit, to grasp after divine wisdom, to prematurely, we see down through their progeny, the emergence of violence, and as a direct result, the way in which the flood is described mirrors the creation of order in Genesis 1. So we can say then that human sin leads to the emergence of disorder. You can see this also in, in Psalm 104. Uh, and I'm reading from verse 5 onwards. He established the earth upon its foundations, so that it will not totter forever and ever. You covered it with the deep as with a garment, 
the waters were standing above the mountains. At your rebuke they fled. At the sound of your thunder they hurried away. The mountains rose, the valleys sank down to the place which you established for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass over, so that they will not return to cover the earth. And so there's a degree of ambiguity. Is that the language of the creation or the language of the flood? And so it's a, a bit of both. The interesting thing about this, of course, is that in the ancient Near East, the oceans represented the forces of chaos. Psalm 104, in fact, talks about a Leviathan. Let me um, touch on this. You'll cover this again in uh, when you read the relevant book chapter, but I think this is a, a point worth thinking about now. In Psalm 104, and verse uh, 26. There go the ships and Leviathan that you formed to sport in it. And life, Leviathan is the dragon. And in the ancient Near East, the dragon represented the forces of chaos. And this is the backstory. And, and just to jump back a little bit, there are a number of writers who point out that there are similarities between the early uh, chapters of Genesis and other ancient Near Eastern stories about origins of human, be human beings and gods and chaos and order and why we wear clothes and all sorts of other things. Not one of those scholars that I've read says that the biblical authors sat down and they copied the written manuscripts of other people to dud the Israelites. No, what they say is they have a theological point to make, and we can throw in a doctrine of inspiration in there, of course. And they breathed the same air as the surrounding nations and wanted to make intelligible points, intelligible theological points, and made distinctive claims to the Israelites. So, for example, the sun, moon, and stars in ancient Near Eastern mythology are all deities in Genesis 1. They're created things, things created by God. But the point is, is that in Psalm 104, for example, the, you see that the, the oceans, the waters that represent the forces of chaos, have a boundary set for them, but they're not eliminated. In other words, what that's saying is that human beings in their sinfulness at any time can potentially release chaos into the world. I think climate change is a classic example. And this, this is what's meant to make sense for you of Revelation 21.1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And that's not meant to disappoint surfers or sailors or those who like to go and have a bit of a doggy paddle at the beach. I don't believe what it's saying is that the new earth will have no ocean. What it's saying is that when God finally comes back to make all things new in its totality, there will be no more chaos in the world. What that looks like, I'm not sure. But the point is, is that the biblical account talks about chaos in the world. Doesn't explain it rationally, doesn't explain it away, but does hint at the role that human beings and human sin plays in it. A few other things from Genesis 1, just to make this a little bit clearer, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep. And the word deep is the Hebrew word tehom. And it's related to the word tiamat, which was the dragon in Mesopotamian myths, again a force of chaos. So what the biblical writers are doing is saying, okay, we know what the ancient our ancient contemporaries are saying. Creation is not a battle between various deities, but it does mean that the creation is somewhat rambunctious and needs taming, and God does that. And human beings can release uh, that those forces of chaos. In fact, Job in Job 3, 1 to 8, and I'll leave it to you to, to look that up, is that he's calling down or wanting someone to call down the chaos monster to undo the entire of creation. Not only is, is Job so miserable that he wants to die, that he wants the entire creation to fall in on itself. And there's a, a reference there to the dragon. So what's the point? The point is that human sin can unleash ecological chaos where things do not function as they should. <laughs>
climate change, sea level rise, the shifting of the seasons, the clearing of forests so creatures go extinct, etc. etc. And here we've got just the representation of that um, in various forms of art. Here's a big question. One of the things that we've kind of skated around, and you can debate this if you like on the forum, but uh, it's an aside issue really. And it's just a question here of, of interest. If there is no historical Adam, where do we place sin and how does this help us with eco-sins? It's not something we're going to resolve in this course. We don't need to. But what it does hint at is how do different approaches to the origin of human beings reflect themselves in how we think about environmental issues. But here's an exercise for you and I want you to then talk about this in the forum. Read the narrative of the construction of the Tower of Babel and compare it to the construction of the Ark, that is Noah's Ark. What differences are there in the use of technology? So, the Tower is a, is a very big tower and the Ark is depicted as a very large boat and they're both responses to situations on the earth of God's judgment and the lack of connection to God in the case of the Tower of Babel where they, they make a tower essentially to draw God down and kind of control God. Now what are the differences in the use of technology? And because we really do need to think about how we respond to it, the ecological crisis as the church and how we embrace or reject certain forms of technology because we will need to rely upon technology. One of the things about human beings it, that we do to a much superior uh, heights or, or complexities to non-human creatures is we, we make use of technology and it can either be used to image God back to the rest of creation or the exact opposite. So think about that, uh, compare those two passages and post your thoughts on the forum. Okay, so that's Act 2. Act 3. One of the key ideas when we come to the nation of Israel is this idea of Sabbath. And it's going to be worth you sitting down and reading these passages. There's very much a creation-shaped framework given to us in the law in Exodus 20. Let me read to you a few verses. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do, shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant, or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So recall, or, or something that we probably I probably didn't tease out, quite properly. Remember we said that Genesis 1 describes creation as a temple and talks about Sabbath ceasing which in Exodus is related to rest and you see God's resting place is in the temple in Jerusalem and that that's creation in miniature. Clearly God resting in the temple does not mean that God puts up God's feet and has a cup of tea. It's not about resting in the sense of being idle and doing nothing because the Ark of the Covenant is described as God's footstool, so it's throne room type language, which means that God rules from the creation temple, God rules from the temple in Jerusalem. Therefore human beings, if we're called to rest, does not mean a ceasing of all activity. And I don't know what tradition you grew up with and whether or not you can play sport on Sunday or do this, that and the other. But it doesn't mean that human dominion over the earth ceases. In fact, it, it's saying that we exercise it, but we don't do it on that particular day in that active sense. Um, what am I trying to get at? I'm saying that the Sabbath pattern remembers who, what, and why of creation. Who's the creator? It's God. What is the creation? What's well, everything that we see? And why is it made? It's made for God to dwell in and for human beings to image him to the rest of creation. <coughs> 
I mean, we could spend a lot of time arguing about what precisely one is allowed to do on a Sunday, but I would suggest to you that the gardening is a perfectly valid activity, for example. But what it's saying, you know, this whole idea of Sabbath, is that it's direct comparison with the modern economy. If you ask yourself what's one of the major sources of or causes of the environmental degradation that we see, it's it, population is one thing, but who has the highest impact upon the planet? Is it uh, India? Is it historically been China? Well, no. The biggest um, emitter per capita of greenhouse gases, at least in the past, has been my country of Australia. And countries like the United States have had huge um, carbon footprints. It's all about the economy and about consumption and not resting from our labours and resting from our... I mean, do you go shopping on a Sunday? Uh, and look, I'm not arguing, for example, to get finicky and say that shops should all be shut on a Sunday. But imagine if they were. Imagine if we went back 20, 30, 40, 50 years and understood that the Sunday was a day of rest, of contemplation, of reflection upon our finitude, our reliance upon God to say, you don't have to work every day of the week to um, receive from God. God gives this day to you as a gift. Of course, there are jobs that have to go 24-7. I was a, a forecast meteorologist for three years and I worked Sundays and Saturdays and nights and public holidays and all manner of things. Sabbath, of course, uh, happens on a larger scale. So Exodus 23, verse um, 10. You shall sow your land for six years and gather in its yield, but on the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow, so that the needy of your people may eat, and whatever they leave the beast of the field may eat. You are to do the same with your vineyard and your olive grove. Now think about this. There's this sense of, of jubilee rest for the land. We're talking about a world before modern fertilizers and the need for fallowing, the need to allow the soil to rest and recuperate. So they were using animal um, dung as fertilizer, and yet in our age you don't have to give land rest because we use nitrogen based fertilizers and phosphorus based fertilizers, and the nitrogen and the phosphorus end up in our waterways and they fertilize the growth of algae which consumes oxygen when it dies producing dead zones where fish can't live, wildlife can't live, etc etc. So modern agriculture is so intensive because human beings have bred in large numbers but we consume so much and we waste so much food, in fact about a third of the food is wasted in the US and that's at the consumer end whereas in the developing world food is was wasted or lost at the other end because of lack of refrigeration, viable transport, etc. So we have enough food to feed the world now, but people suffer obesity well of the starved to death. There's something broken about modern agriculture, and you'll cover that when you read um, All Things New. Is this also an argument uh, when it talks about rest for livestock against modern factory farming, which treats animals not as individual creatures made by God but as inputs into the economy faceless, nameless, needless creatures that you have to pump full of um, antibiotics because they live in appalling conditions is this an argument against modern agriculture? and you'll notice in Exodus 23 there are gleaning laws so it's all about provision from your crops for the poor so that should be reflected in, in other ways, I guess, these days. And the beasts of the field being provided for. So, letting livestock, etc., uh, feast. Uh, Leviticus 25 picks up the similar theme. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather its in its crop. But during the seventh year the land shall have a Sabbath rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall not sow your fields, nor prune your vineyard. Your harvest after growth you shall not reap, and your grapes of untrimmed vines you shall not gather. The land shall have a sabbatical year, and all of you, all of you shall have the Sabbath products of the land for food, yourself and your male and female slaves and your hired men and your foreign resident, those who live as aliens with you. 
even your cattle and your animals that are in your land shall have all its crops to eat. So it's all it's all inclusive. And there are rules too of land management. Deuteronomy 25 verse 4 You shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. Deuteronomy 20.19 When you besiege a city a long time to make war against it in order to capture it, you shall not destroy the trees by swinging an axe against them, for you may eat from them, and you shall not cut them down. For is the tree of the field a man that you should besiege it, should, that it should be besieged by you? Only the trees which you know are not fruit trees you shall destroy and cut down, that you may construct siege works against the city that is making war with you until it falls. So, it's pragmatic, don't cut down fruit trees, it also limits damage. You're not at war with the trees. That contrasts very strongly with what happened in Vietnam, where American forces said, well, we can't find the Viet Cong, so let's destroy the forest with Agent Orange. Very different way of thinking. They waged war against the trees. Or Deuteronomy 22 and verse 6, If you happen to come upon a bird's nest along the way, in any tree or on the ground, with young ones or eggs, and the mother sitting on the young or on the eggs, you shall not take the mother with the young. You shall certainly let the mother go. But the young you may take for yourself in order that it may be well with you, and that it may, you may prolong your days. So it's, it's not modern environmentalism, but it is a degree of pragmatism and sensibility that says, well, you don't wipe out a potential source of food and you don't wipe out other creatures simply for your use because they have a, a right to exist on their own. Another aspect, um, and we could spend hours on this, is comes from Walter Brueggemann's book, The Land. And what he wants to say is that land is a central idea in the covenant, the relationship between Israel and God, that land plays a prominent role. Uh, land care is at the key of what's talked about, not environment or environmentalism, uh, you know, which is a development of land care. So it's it's largely a pragmatism, but not entirely so. But now we think about ecotheology, environmentalism, as thinking more and more and more about the things that the Bible says about the right for non-human creatures to exist unmolested by human beings. The land of, is used as a metaphor, and we've already touched upon this, as a place where the Israelites would have rest and shalom. And shalom means peace, but it means more than just absence of conflict, but the ability to enjoy the good life. Graham Goldsworthy, an Australian theologian, describes being the land as God's people, in God's place, under God's rule. Or, if you prefer, in Genesis 12, 1-3, it's with God's blessing which is both a blessing to enjoy, but a blessing to share with the surrounding nations. And we see um, in the book of Genesis, really, this idea of landedness and landlessness. So Genesis 1 to 11 sees a landed people always on the verge or in the act of being made landless. So Adam and Eve are rejected from the garden. Cain is sent east of Eden. The Noah and his his family are, are made landless, floating upon the flood waters, and then the inhabitants of Babel are made landless. They're scattered over the earth, and this is really meant to be understood as what's the pattern of the history of Israel. The idea of of falling into idolatry and breaking the covenant, and then being ejected into exile. You see a contrast between wilderness, um, or, or rather uh, a, a relationship between wilderness and landlessness. Uh, wilderness is kind of, uh, it's an agricultural idea of, of reflecting, as we talked about earlier, places of no agricultural value. And this is spoken about in Psalm 104, and it actually upholds the value of wilderness and God's care for it. Those parts of the world outside of human concern, or direct human concern, in an agricultural sense that God cares for them as much as he does for human beings. And remember, this is an age well before the wildlife documentary. Have a read of Psalm 104 and you'll see this. But also the fact that in a landless state, the people of Israel wander in the wilderness. Think about what happens 
after the Exodus, and the Israelites leave Egypt, and they're on the, the borders of the land, and spies are sent in, and some of the spies say, oh, no, we can't do this. The people are too large, they're too numerous. And God says, okay, the entire of this generation will not enter the land that I've promised you, the land of flowing with milk and honey, the land of rest and shalom. You will wander in the wilderness in a state of landlessness, and then finally they enter into the land the next generation. Uh, land management, as we've already noted, is kind of key in, in Israel because they relied upon uh, fertile soils, but nonetheless soils that were provided for by, by rain and not the regular flooding that, say, they saw in Mesopotamia or in Egypt. So it was a precarious situation. While the Brueggemann also says that there's a direct relationship between the role of the prophets and the land, and, and what he means by this, in essence, is that there's a tying to Israel's place in the land and their keeping of the covenant, but also that the prophets very often spoke back to the king who was responsible for leading the people in or out of idolatry. And that you think of the story of... Um, I'm trying to think which king it is now, King Ahab and his acquiring of, uh, of that field and the critique of the prophets that the very rich including the king would join field to field and house to house so that people were losing access to their ancestral land and their ability to provide for themselves. So there's a tension between what the kings tried to do over time from, particularly from the time of Solomon onwards, of wanting a standing army and acquiring wealth. And so if you have a standing army, therefore you need to have a surplus, and so people are growing food for you and no longer growing it for themselves and their own needs. So that land becomes a real point of tension for the people. So land occupies a really central role, and it's well worth digging into that book if you can find it. We're not going to talk about it much more directly in this course. But land is central, and care for the land. There is uh, a number of passages there, or there are a number of passages there, that talk about the impact of... Um, idolatry growth, or the relationship rather between idolatry growth and ecological destruction. Before I go on to that, I've just got a few more notes that you will see just to touch on. Um, so there's the set, um, this, as we talked about, uh, Genesis 1-11 to is conquest and echoes conquest and monarchy from landlessness to landedness to landlessness, and then Genesis 12-50 to uh, is landlessness um, the de desert want uh, and Genesis 12 to 50 mirrors the desert wanderings, the exile, and the anticipation of becoming landed once more. So land is, is a critical theme. It's either you have it, and you're probably not managing it very well in your relationship with God, and you there's forever the threat of being exiled, and you're in exile, and there's this promise of being returned to the land. So it sets up the idea of not taking land for granted, of the link between God, Israel, and the land through keeping the law, keeping the Torah. And we've talked about landlessness as wilderness already, so that's Exodus 16 to 18, Numbers 10 to 14, being the people of faith in landlessness, in that desert wandering, so that they will eventually receive the blessing of being in the land. And Psalm 104 and certainly the wilderness wanderings, there's this kind of tension really, because while the people are meant to occupy the land, it's the promise once they, they leave Egypt, and they experience God there, initially in various shrines, and then eventually the Jerusalem temple, yet you see that wilderness can be a real liminal space. For example, Psalm 104, um, again worth reading, the idea that one can encounter God even when you're in a state of landlessness and feel somewhat abandoned by God, it's at those periods of time uh, that God can be as close to you. And I think, too, it's very often that uh, Christians down through the ages have talked about going into the desert, going into the wilderness to experience God afresh. <coughs> 
Uh, as we've noted, Torah consists of guidelines for land management, to have no images that alienate us from history, by which um, Brueggemann means that God reveals God's self in history. Um, the people leave Egypt and wander through the promised land in history and enter into the land through history, and so making images will alienate you from that unfolding narrative. Uh, that the guidelines of land management include the Sabbath, so that life is not coercive. Think about the slavery and the lack of rest that people had in Egypt. Uh, but also, uh, we've seen in the various passages that we've read the, that the principles of land management include the honouring or caring for those covenant brothers and sisters who, although they may not have power, have dignity, the poor, the stranger, the sojourner, the widow, the orphan, and the Levite. Remember, the Levites didn't have a share of the land. They relied upon others to um, provide for them. Uh, this idea uh, we've talked about, about already about prophets. Prophets are intended to address the kings. It is because of kings that prophets appear. Kingship gone wrong. And the gift of the prophet in Israel stands in contrast to the temptations of land, namely magical practices of self-securing and manipulations. So, in other words, think about Baalism and various forms of pagan idolatry. The temptation of land is, well, we want the land to be fertile, so we want regular rains, so we'll go to the temple and worship God, but we'll have an each-way bet and worship uh, pagan deities as well. Um, and so there's tensions between royally secured land and covenanted precarious land, which I've talked about already. So royally secured land is land that the king acquires, or the use thereof at least, to produce the surplus, to feed his huge cohort, to maintain um, uh, the temple court and the standing army, etc., versus land that's set aside for each family to provide for their needs. And so we've seen this, this um, comparison of Sabbath economics and Jubilee versus self-indulgent consumerism. Uh, and the key passage I was uh, alluding to earlier about the land acquired is 1 Kings 21 and it's I invite you maybe to reflect upon that on the forum Naboth's vineyard and how that is a breaking of Deuteronomy 28 63 to 68 now idolatry growth and ecological destruction and it will be well worth you looking through each of these passages but let's just focus um, primarily on Jeremiah 5 and I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible here do you not fear me declares the Lord do you not tremble in my presence for I have placed the sand as a boundary for the sea as an eternal decree so it cannot be cannot cross over it so there's a going back to the flood though the waves toss yet they cannot prevail though they roar yet they cannot cross over it but this people has a stubborn and rebellious heart, and they have turned aside and departed. They do not say in their heart, Let us now fear the Lord our God, who gives rain in its season, both the autumn rain and the spring rain, who keeps for us the appointed weeks of the harvest. Your iniquities have turned these away, and your sins have withheld good from you. For wicked men are found among my people. They watch like fowlers lying in wait. They set a trap. They catch men, like a cage full of birds, so their houses are full of deceit. Therefore they have become great and rich. They are fat, they are sleek, they also excel in deeds of wickedness. They do not plead the cause, the cause of the orphan, that they may prosper, and they do not defend the rights of the poor. And so what you see here is, and, and you'll see it in other passages, is an idea that there is an embedded structure to the world. Uh, but before we get to that, let's uh, quickly go over some of these other passages. Numbers 18, the importance of having your own land to provide for your needs. Leviticus 25, the Jubilee reset. So verse um, 13, on this year of Jubilee, each of you shall return to his own property so they can provide for their needs. Um, 1 Samuel 8 and 2, 1 Kings 4, the issue of surplus in a standing army. Empire is expensive and creates imbalance. We've been talking around this issue. 
a 1 Kings 21, the pagan king and land grabbing, so that's no boss field. Isaiah 5.8, pro prophetic judgment, are uh, you who join house to house, who add field to field, until there is no room for, for no one but you, and you are left to live alone in the midst of the land. And 1 Kings 16 to 17, which is a judgment for idolatry. So Michael Northcote actually wants to say that he, this is an unfolding kind of pattern. And what he's saying in this is, is to take a step back and say, and in fact it goes back to this cartoon from um, Gary Larson, does God sit at God's divine computer and press the smite button when we sin? And I'm not for a moment arguing for a non-interventionist God. But are there times, and particularly when it comes to ecological sins or sins against the creation, where there's a direct link between idolatry, growth, and ecological destruction? In other words, as, as Michael North talks about, is there something about the character of God embedded in the creation? Let's follow the link. Okay, we want to be like the nations. Give us a king. Uh, Saul's a bit of a mess up. David does a little bit better, but he also messes up. And then you get Solomon, the great empire builder. And it goes downhill from there. So if you want to be like the nations, you need a king, you need a court, you need a standing army. So you need to control the climate so you can grow more crops. So there's a temptation to turn to pagan idolatry. Because all these pagan deities are all nature deities. You engage in empire thinking, which means a standing army, as we've talked about, and military expansion and a need for a surplus. So what do you do? You don't give the land the Sabbath rest every seven years. You might have two harvests per year. Remember again, we're talking about pre-chemical fertilizers. So you push the land hard and you dispossess people, as we saw in some of the passages. And again, I suggest you look at those and discuss them on the forum. And so the land collapses. And yes, there are interventionist divine judgment acts. So other nations come in, the Assyrians come in and push Israel out and they're exiled, etc. But the environmental aspects come all the way back to the desire to be like the surrounding nations, not be different. Not be people who are characterized by a respect for the Creator God and for God's creation and relying upon God and, and therefore being shaped by this regular Sabbath rest, seven days, seven years, seven lots of seven, etc. So this is built into the ecosystem, these, this idea of natural limits. And so there's a natural ethic we have to live with or else. Uh, and I'm just going to finish uh, that section with the following. Revelation 11, 18. And the nations were enraged, and your wrath came, and the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bond servants, the prophets, and all the saints, and those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth, those who exceed the natural limits. So that's Act 3. That's the Israel. And you can see there's quite a bit we can learn about the way in which we engage in agriculture, which of course, if you go back to Genesis 1, and you'll hear this in the Richard Middleton lecture, really fundamental to bearing the image of God is in fact agriculture. Even if you never step on a farm in your life. The Gospel, of course, recounts God coming into the world. So John 1, for example, is interested in Christology, which is the theology of the person of Christ, and not cosmology. But when you read Genesis chapter 1, and I, again I invite you to go through and do this in more detail, we're just going to skip over this briefly, you see strong echoes of Genesis 1. So this should be telling you something. And it's picking up of, on the idea of Torah, or the law, or wisdom as a divine agent of creation. So I've, I've traced the parallels here. So Genesis 1 in the beginning, John 1 in the beginning, Genesis 1, God, and Gen uh, John 1, uh, 1 to 2, the Logos, or the Word, was with and was God. In Genesis 1, we read that God created the heavens and the earth, and in one, John 1, 3, that all things, tarpanta in the Greek, came into being. In verses 3 to 5 of Genesis 1, God creates light, which is day, and, well, he separates light from day. He doesn't actually create darkness. It says darkness is already there, so God creates time. But then you get, um, in verses 4 to 5 of John 1, 
light is the life of all people and the darkness doesn't understand or overcome it and that the word in verses 6 through 9 is the true light of the world so a very deliberate echoing in John chapter 1 of Genesis chapter 1 so some key ideas then uh, Jesus the Logos is identified with God so this is high Christology as they talk about the Logos is a familiar idea in Hellenistic Judaism, that is, Jews who lived amongst Gentiles and were influenced by Greek thinking, um, and is equated with the Torah, the law, and or divine wisdom. The Logos is the divine creative agent, who was with God in the beginning, and all things came into being through the Logos, hence the Logos is uncreated. So there's the beginnings of Trinitarian theology here. Um, there's ideas already of new creation right in this passage here. In other words, if John 1 uses um, L echoes Genesis 1 to describe Jesus coming into the world, John is saying that there's something new about creation happening that's in direct continuity with Genesis 1 and the creation of the divine temple, but now the presence of God is coming amongst God's people in a new and fresh way. So it's a new creation, a new creative act. Um, life is of the age to come eternal life or the life of the age and it's not simply uh, spiritual um, and I, there's a reference here to Lazarus in, in John 11 um, and this is one of those moments where I've forgotten precisely what I mean here so let's turn to it really quickly and see if we can work it out together Death of Lazarus well of course it's Jesus says that I'm the resurrection and the life um, so Jesus is the source of all life, and that's manifest in the resurrection, or the resuscitation perhaps, of, of Lazarus. So in other words, this isn't just a spiritual creation, it's a physical creation. Of course, that's ultimately summed up in Jesus' resurrection. And Richard Borkham points out that um, the Logos becomes not human, but sarx, which is the Greek word for flesh. And he says that there's a commonality and kinship with the rest of creation, different forms of flesh. So Jesus is not simply identifying fundamentally with human beings, though clearly he does, and that's tied up in atonement theology, but he's fundamentally identifying with created reality. And John 1 is therefore an act of new creation, where we get the sense that the entire of creation is wrapped up in this, even if human beings are central players. Uh, just a quick reflection upon cosmos, or world. Some would argue that cosmos means all things in John, hence the idea that John 3.16 means God died because of God's love for all of creation. Craig Keener in his commentary disagrees and says that nothing in John 1 would make suggest cosmos means creation, as it does in Romans 8, where Paul uh, uses a different word for creation. We can make an indirect link via Romans 8 and Genesis 3 to the extent that a redeemed cosmos, humanity, means the curse undone in our relationship to it, but the cosmos as um, all things is, is a little bit unconvincing. So what I'm saying here in, in essence is that um, the language of coming into the world primarily I think means in John the human world, human society, because it's the world doesn't know God, but ultimately the impact uh, or the benefit is for all things, um, which is what we can see in verse 3. So there's an ongoing debate in terms of how far inclusive uh, this is. And here's, here's this, just um, those implications as we've been talking about them. So new creation is bookended in John. So whereas in, in John chapter 1 you can see deliberate echoes of Genesis 1, and saying that Jesus coming into the world is an act of new creation and therefore the work of Jesus is inclusive of all of creation that's even made clearer uh, Genesis 2 4 in the day the Lord made heavens and the earth um, is the first day of the week in John 20 in Genesis 1 we see the creation of light in the beginning of John 20 it was still dark which is of course back to John 1 as well the darkness and it's that idea that the darkness doesn't overcome the light. The light overcomes the darkness. And in Genesis 1, of course, the creation of the light, light separated from darkness. In Genesis 2, um, 
8, the man is put into the garden. In John 20.15, Mary supposes Jesus to be the gardener. And I'm not for a minute saying that John made this up. I'm simply saying he's drawing out the parallels that are already there. And, and because John, being a Jew, knew about Genesis 2, right? Genesis 2.22, man and woman in the garden. So woman is made as a fit helper. And that's not a, a, a denigratory term, because God is described in the same terms as being a helper. And in John 20.17, Mary is to announce the resurrection to the disciples. So a woman is the first apostle, the first sent one, and she is a helper to Jesus. In Genesis 2.24, man is to cling to his wife, and but in contrast, Mary is not to cling to Jesus, because... Um, Jesus is going to ascend and his followers are meant to go out into all the world. So it's it's interesting too. And of course the whole idea that this resurrection is creation of new life in, in the same way in which Genesis 2 talks about the creation of life. So these parallels are meant to scream at us, shout at us that John is concerned with the renewal of all things and not just the saving of human souls. And in fact, you can see being in Christ means completing the work that Adam was created to do. In the Synoptic Gospels, there's a number of hints. Um, Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the good news is the Evangelion, and that echoes Isaiah uh, chapter 40, verse 9. And verses 2 to 3 of Mark quote Isaiah 43 to 4, which is forgiveness of sins, uh, means return from exile to the land, God's people in God's place under God's rule. And in essence what that means is that the material world matters to God. Luke 4 verses 14 to 30, and I, I want you to read these things and talk about these on the forum. The Nazareth Manifesto, particularly verses 18 and 19, is a, a jubilee year. Let me just read this to you really quickly now, and you can have a closer look and discuss this online later. Luke 4, and verses 18 to 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour, which is the Jubilee year. So not only does this mean the end of debts and slavery, compare this to Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, but note the non, uh, note non-violent. Um, verse 2b, uh, he represents um, not a very good pronouncement for the Gentile nations, but Jesus deliberately leaves it out. Uh, as a Sabbath year, the land gets a rest, and wild animals have access to the fields, as we saw in Leviticus 25, 7. So Jesus' whole mission is shaped by seeing it as, uh, as a rest for everyone, the Jubilee year, and that includes the non-human as well as the human. Um, Mark 1 verses 12 and 13 is, is somewhat enigmatic. It's unique to Mark. And the, the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness uh, 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Uh, and so, remember, it's this kind of land versus wilderness. Wilderness is a place in which you encounter God, but wilderness also is dangerous. A dangerous place of pilgrimage um, is wilderness somehow satanic uh, in Jesus victory does he conquer um, the wild animals uh, as well so there's this echo Isaiah 66 picture of uh, the new heavens and the new earth the lion sits down with the lamb and you, ha you can handle the serpent etc etc it's somewhat enigmatic nonetheless you can see hints in the synoptics that the coming of Jesus has an implication for the non-human creation as well. One of the central planks of Christianity is the idea of the atonement. And we see that Colossians 1 describes that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. 
He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the church, head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, that's the fullness of God, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him I say, whether things on heaven or things on earth. And so while we tend to think about the atonement as an act of reconciling human beings to God, we see here in Colossians 1 that the atonement, that the cross, reconciles all things to God. So that's highly suggestive, isn't it? Not. So you might want to go away and have a bit more of a think. Richard Borkham at this point says that Jesus Christ is to be understood most fully in his relationship to God and to the whole creation. Relationship to Christ is what will, in the end, constitute the peace for the whole creation. So if your theology of the atonement doesn't include the entire creation, it's inadequate. The need for Jesus to overcome spiritual powers that bring chaos to creation, but that chaos includes us and our actions, says Borkham. So... And this comes back to what we were talking about earlier in comparing Genesis 1 with the flood, how human sin, the violence discussed in, in Genesis 6, releases chaos, leads to the release of chaos and the undoing of the good order of creation. And that's what Borkham's getting at here. The cross, to be sure, achieves forgiveness of human sins, but the goal is that God reconciles all things to himself. So this represents a moving beyond individualistic and heavenist atonement theology. Yes, eco-theology has implications for the cross. I want to speak um, somewhat briefly about something known as Christus Victor. So, <clears throat> I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Here's a discussion question to go on the forum. What views of the atonement are you aware of? Which do you think address broader creation concerns? So, a book well worth getting uh, hold of, and we're just going to pick the eyes out of it and follow along with the notes. Tom Wright, in his book Evil and the Justice of God, makes the following points that are worth reflecting upon. The Bible lays out the problem of evil in Genesis 1-11, through 11, although somewhat enigmatically. Like, where's the serpent come from? An agent of chaos. Um... And there's curse on relationships of humans between God, others, and the creation. Although the curse between human beings and the land is actually undone by Noah. So it's kind of um, interesting from that point of view. The solution to the problem of, this curses, of these curses, or the breaking of the relationship between humans and God, is the call of Abraham. The eventual formation of the people of Israel, described in Genesis 12, 1-3, about them being blessed and being a blessing and taking possession of the land. The history of Israel is that it is the nation of Israel becomes part of the solution, this blessing it's meant to be, but also part of the problem. Read, for example, Romans 2.23. You that boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. And that, of course, is a reference to the exile. So Israel was meant to be a solution to the problem of evil in the world, and Israel made a mess of it, and so they were exiled. And so the surrounding nations said, well, look at you. And God says, well, you know, you're actually blaspheming my name, because people point at the nation of Israel and say, oh, they're God, Yahweh, he's nothing. The solution, of course, is expanded in Isaiah 40 to 55. The gospel is the gathering of Israel back into the land, you see the role of the servant, which is, of course, a role that Jesus takes up. Initially, is Israel, in Isaiah 41, verse 8, to bring justice, 42, 1 to 3. Isaiah 53, 10 to 12, um, describes or relates death to exile. And you can see comparisons in Genesis 3, as um, Adam and Eve are uh, exiled from the garden. Mark 10, 45, that says that Jesus gives his life as a ransom for many, uh, finds its echoes in Isaiah 53. But this is a political context. Because Jesus says, you know, don't be like the Gentiles. Let me read it for you. For this, oh, here we go. Um, 
So Jesus, this is verse 42, called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it's not to be so among you. And then he talks about you know, Jesus giving his life as a ransom for many. In other words, one of the things that you see in the Old Testament, that's a little bit muted in the New Testament, that's, that's still there, is that the cross represents the overthrowing of the powers of empire. Israel's failed religious institutions and the super-personal uh, being behind it, which is the, the, the Satan. In other words, Jesus is crucified as a false messiah, a false king, a pretender to the throne of Israel and a challenge to Rome, although it wasn't really because, of course, he was promoting non-violence, etc. And the resurrection says, not guilty. What's the worst thing an empire can do? It can make a martyr out of someone. But if that person is then raised from the dead, what's God saying about the charges that were brought against the person who was who was put to death? In this case, of course, Jesus, who was crucified. One of the things Tom Wright talks about a lot is that uh, Jesus is tempted by the devil, Luke 3. Peter is described as being Satan for denying the path of the cross. You know, he says, Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. And the devil enters in, into Judas before he betrays Jesus. In Mark's Gospel, Jesus says that I am tying up the strong man to pillage his house. And that's what you see in the casting out of demons. In John's Gospel, the ruler of this world is driven out and is judged. So John 12, 31 and 16, 11. And the solution is a non-violent one, which is shaped Christian activism for centuries. See, for example, Matthew 11, 12. Finally, uh, of course, we see, or penultimately, that on the cross, Jesus is proclaimed king, king of the Jews. Uh, so the titulus, or the title, is in three different languages, saying that Jesus is the king of the Jews. So the cross is really his crowning. But in Romans 1, the resurrection is the validation of that claim that Jesus is indeed king. Uh, and in verse uh, 4 it says and that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. And Son of God means Christ, means Messiah, means King of Israel. It doesn't primarily mean God the Son, although obviously it's filled with that value as well. So to summarize really briefly, Jesus' nonviolent approach, his healing of people with disease, his freeing them from satanic bondage, and dying falsely accused by Israel and Rome with Satan lurking behind, takes on the cause Israel was meant to. The resurrection shows his claims to be true and the charges false. Death as the last enemy and cause of exile. So see, for example, 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul talks about death as the last enemy. Jesus has won a victory over evil and establishes the kingdom of God, which includes land and peace or shalom in it. Note there is a penal element in Romans 8. Uh, for God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to deal with sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. Uh, and this isn't none of this is a denial of the personal value of the atonement, but what it's saying is there's a big, big narrative that runs through biblical history of the promise uh, through Abraham and the setting up of the Jewish nation, the failure of the Jewish nation and of Jewish kingship in particular, and Jesus coming as the long-promised king and fulfilling all that Israel was meant to, taking on the powers of the day, the biggest empire of the day, and all the environmental destruction that went along with the running of an empire, and all the cursing of the relationship between human beings and the land which they were meant to occupy, that is the people of Israel, and defeating those powers on the cross, including the super-spiritual powers behind them which of course is the Satan. Uh, Galatians 2, for though the law, through the law I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So Galatians reminds us that the atonement is intensely personal, but thinking about the sweeping narrative, and I invite you to go through all those passages in this brief summary of evil and justice of God, there's a bigger story going on.
uh, Alexander, before we move on, Alexander Solzhenitsyn uh, in the Gulag Archipelago says, If only there were evil people some were insidiously committing evil deeds, and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the dividing line, the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. So when we think about this grand narrative, when we come to the, the Act 4, uh, we have to understand that the cross deals with individual human sin and evil, but it deals with it on a larger scale as well, all the way up to the satanic. Now, in the age of the church, which is a large chunk of the New Testament, we need to think a little bit. And now we're moving, if you like, into eschatology. And I'm going to go over this fairly quickly because you will deal with this uh, in later part of the course. But we need to discuss Act 5. And Act 5 tells us that creation has a future and we're living in that now and not yet phase where Christ has been crucified and raised from the dead. He's been declared king of the world. All authority has been given to Jesus on, in heaven and on earth and we're sent into the nations to make disciples of everyone. But the job is not finished and the creation is not renewed but the process has begun. So Romans 8 is a key passage to think about this. Uh, we live in the age of the spirit, the age of the church. And there's a fascinating, uh, although there's no, by no means, um, uniform agreement amongst Roman scholars on this, but there's a fascinating parallel between what happens to the church and what happened to Israel. Firstly, Romans 8. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you, you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may be glorified with him. Now, there's this language uh, of, of slavery and certainly it resonates in Paul writing to the church in Rome because one third of the population of Rome were slaves and it's quite possible that pretty much all the early Christians in Rome were slaves and so this language resonates but think about uh, slavery to sin and slavery in Egypt Paul talks in Romans 8 about being led by the Spirit well what happened to the Israelites they were led by the fiery pillar at night and the sm smoky pillar during the day, the Spirit of God. Uh, the spirit of slavery can also, as we've noted, be a reference to the Exodus. And think how the, the Israelites romanticized Egypt and wanted to return. And that, that slavery wasn't simply physical. Because what did they do in the wilderness when things got a bit messy? They created a golden calf, possibly the apis bull which is um, a, an Egyptian uh, religious idol. Um, the adopt language of adoption of sons echoes the call to Pharaoh. Let my son go, he says, uh, says Moses in um, Exodus 3.10. Oh, sorry, rather God. Um, Moses then goes on and says the same thing to Pharaoh. But Exodus, Exodus 3... And verse 10. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Well, uh, that's actually a smoothing over. This is part of the problem with the, uh, at times with gender inclusive language. Um, actually uses the language of son. And I think, again, that's being echoed here. When we get to, um, and, and so finally this passage, and, and it's verses 14 through 17, what does it mean uh, the children to be heirs? Heirs of what? You inherit something. So what I'm trying to say is that you, there are parallels between what happened to Egypt and what happens to the church, and the arrival point should look something similar. Uh, verse 18 for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us for the anxious longing of the creation 
waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God, for the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will also be set free from its slavery to corruption, into the freedom, the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption of sons, the redemption of our body. Now I'm flying through this quickly because I just want to draw out a few key points. We'll talk about creation groaning more precisely later on in the course. Um, there's a divine passive here, that creation is subject to futility. Uh, the divine passive meaning that obviously it's God who subjects it to this futility. We can tease this apart more later, but slavery to corruption, and we await for the redemption of our bodies, that's Exodus language. Um, uh, sorry, let, let me make this a bit clearer. The creation itself will also be set free from its slavery to corruption. Being set free from slavery is Exodus language. Likewise, it talks about we eagerly await for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. And the redemption, again, is slavery language, is Exodus language. And of course, it, it also reflects the fact that many of the church in first century Rome would have been slaves. So, what I'm saying then is, is if slavery to sin in Romans mirrors slavery in Egypt, uh, in 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about passing through the Red Sea as baptism. If being led by the Spirit in Romans mirrors uh, Egypt's experience of being led through the wilderness by the presence of God, then just in the same point in the narrative as the people of Egypt entered the Promised Land, it's a nonsense to suggest that the end point of a, a Christian's pilgrimage is heaven when you die. No, it's a new heavens and a new earth, a redeemed creation that itself undergoes its own exodus. Spend some time thinking about that and discuss it on the forum. Is that a convincing argument? Does that make sense to you? That somehow or other that this exodus language is being used in Romans and describes the journey of the Christian people, not just the individual, but also the whole of creation itself. It's intriguing. This is the fifth act, the age of the spirit. And it has to end at some point, and the end is not being raptured off to heaven when we die, but it's in fact the whole creation being redeemed. Uh, this is just a brief schematic uh, of what's happening in Romans 8, and you can see the spirit represented by the dove groans for, uh, for us, and we worship God through it. We rule over the creation, but the creation groans for our adoption. Uh, as, as groaning in birth pains because very clearly there's something about the future resurrection where the earth won't groan under human beings anymore. In other words, that we will complete the task that was set to Adam. And I've just indicated too that the spirit hovers over the waters in, in Genesis chapter 1. And it's the same spirit that brings new life to the creation in Psalm 104. So, we groan the creation groans, the spirit groans for us. Does the spirit groan for the creation as well? Is there a role for lament in prayer and in song over what we've done for the creation in our church gathering? Very lastly then, I want to say really briefly, and we're going to pick up on this later. In fact, I won't spend much time on it. I'll leave you to read the notes. I've already talked for long enough. That Peter is not talking about the literal destruction of the created world. Why else would he contrast it with the flood, where chaos is brought to order, but then order is returned? And it's intriguing, isn't it, that through the flood, a remnant of humanity is saved, but also a remnant of the animals. And so how can 2 Peter be talking about a literal destruction of the earth if Peter draws a direct comparison between the two? I'll actually leave you to read the notes at this point. We've already covered a lot of ground. And you will come back to this point again. But I just want to link that back with Romans 8 and say that we've gone through the five acts of the five-act play of Scripture and seen in each of those acts the status of the non-human creation is elevated and the 
the human beings and then the people of God in particular are given a particular role to care for that creation. And that carries all the way through to the end of the story where both the creation and human beings are renewed. So in other words, I want to say therefore that there's a, a tight relationship between eco-theology, which is a theological reflection upon our relation to the creation and God as creator of things other than humans, and the Missio Dei, the mission of God, which was to create a temple for God to dwell in and reflect God's self to the rest of the creation through the image of God, which is us. So somehow or other, the mission of God must be manifested in the mission of the church. And if God cares about the creation and God has a future for the creation, so Christians should be very much uh, involved in that mission. So thank you for your forbearance and all the best uh, discussing these issues on the forum. I look forward to dialoguing, dialoguing with you there.